All right, so uh, I'm excited. We are in uh, PFT 118. So this is going to be anatomy and physiology for fitness professionals. <coughs> title. Um, so uh, this is PFT 118. Um, this is going to be kind of similar to our physiology class that uh, Andres, uh, Kenny, that you guys uh, started in. Uh, this will be somewhat similar to that, uh, except that we're going to do a little bit more overall, and we will talk a little bit more in, about anatomy. So we're going to get a little bit of the structural stuff, um, you know, labeled really efficiently and stuff like that. Uh, this is also going to work its way out of your NASM textbooks. Uh, so we will uh, get into those. This isn't just your NASM textbook, though. We are actually going to be working out of our anatomy and physiology textbook. Um, and your NASM textbook. So uh, the text you guys are going to need for this class is uh, Memler's Guide to uh, Human Body. Uh, this one right here, I think your guys is probably looks like they've changed the freaking cover to this book 100,000 times, but it's the one that says Memler's. <laughs> um, so uh, make sure you guys grab your Memler's textbook. Um, like I said, it, I think the last time I saw it, it was this black cover here. Um, so hopefully it should some, look something like this, but this is the title Memler's, you know, the human body and health and disease and stuff. Um, don't worry. You don't have to read this entire textbook in 12 days, but you do have to read, uh, a few of the select chapters. So it's chapter one, uh, it's chapter two, uh, and then, uh, it skips forward several chapters. Um, I'll explain which ones later because <laughs> I don't have them memorized. <laughs> so that is going to be, uh, those are going to be. Uh, what we go over. So our first day, today we're going to go over the organization of the human body, uh, which is really a cool section because like we are going to talk a little bit about like how we label different things in the body and how we understand them. Uh, tomorrow we'll get into a little bit of like chemistry, which is really fun. We'll do a little bit uh, talking about organic compounds and how they relate to human biology. So we'll be looking at like um, you know, our monomers again and things like that. Um, then we are going to move into the skeletal and the muscular systems, which obviously very, very relevant uh, to us as personal trainers. The day after that, we'll get into the nervous system. Uh, and then we will also get the endocrine system in there as well. So uh, we'll be going over you can see here the three parts of the kinetic chain in the Memler's textbook, um, plus a little bit of the endocrine system. I'll be honest, the endocrine system, we are going to blast through that in like 10 minutes. Like, uh, it's a very, very, very short uh, process for that because we do talk about hormones, but like our ability to affect hormones is relatively limited as trainers. And so um, we don't talk a ton about them. Um, but then day five here, uh, you can see this is where we're going to break down uh, basic exercise science is what's called. This is your actual NASM textbook chapter two. So this is where I really need you guys to have that uh, sixth edition uh, so that we can really get you into um, this chapter two section here. Uh, so that's something that I'm going to have solved hopefully by the end of the week. Um, but that is where we are going to kind of go uh, our first section here. So we're talking about the organization of things, a little bit of chemistry tomorrow, uh, the kinetic chain two days after that. And then we're going to do a big summary of everything that's in your NASM textbook. So you guys are kind of familiar with the Sochi program by now. You guys know that like uh, the way we like to do things is we like to introduce stuff and then we kind of filter it, you know. Oftentimes I will filter the PowerPoints with the notes and then the homework will filter, you know, questions from, from the notes and the PowerPoints and stuff, right? So think of it as this is going to be more information than you need. And then we're going to filter it with like the NASM PowerPoint that is like, all right, here's all the relevant stuff to us, you know? Um, so that'll be really, really kind of fun there. Then we'll do a review and a midterm on day six. This is going to be February 24th. This is going to be our next in-person meeting. So we're on day one today, which is the 17th, day two, day three, day four, day five, and then day six, which is February 24th. This is going to be our next in the park meeting uh, at 9 a.m. or 6 p.m. Uh, we'll get together. We'll do a fun little workout. Um, 
you know, it'll be uh, uh, just kind of a fun thing to kind of go through. This is actually our youth mod. Um, for those of you, since you guys all kind of already know what that means, uh, the program design class that will be in the end of this module is going to be uh, program design for youths. So we're going to do a lot of fun SAQ stuff, a lot of fun cone drills and things like that. Uh, and so that's kind of the, what our workouts will sort of be based around. They're going to be based around a lot of the fun stuff that you can do, um, boot campy stuff for youths and things like that. Uh, then we'll move over to uh, day seven here, which is going to be the heart and our blood vessels. So we're going to get into uh, the cardiovascular system. Uh, then we'll do the respiratory system. And then we're going to kind of summarize all that up together uh, with NASM's cardiorespiratory system. So that'll be NASM's chapter three. Uh, we'll do a little bit in the digestive system. We'll do a little bit of nutrition. So that one's kind of a big jump, but we'll go over to NASM chapter 17. Um, then we will do metabolism. Uh, followed by NASM's Guide to Metabolism, uh, which is uh, chapter four. Mm -hmm. So you'll notice we are getting all of the really heavy, big science uh, stuff out of the way uh, here in this class. So this is going to be the first four chapters of your NASM textbook. Well, I shouldn't say first four. It's your chapters two, three, and four. First chapter is like, here's why trainers are important. <laughs> First chapter is totally like an intro chapter that no one reads. Uh, <laughs> so like uh, that's chapters two, three, and four there, uh, which are some of the most uh, sort of complex chapters in terms of just like foundational knowledge. Then we'll have our review and our final exam where we will be meeting on March 4th. Um, that's going to be a Thursday. Uh, and again, we'll do another in-person meeting that'll be really, really, really fun there. So that is sort of what we're going over in this anatomy class, just really briefly showing you guys, um, and I know you guys have all, all seen this already, um, but just to show you one more review really quick and where you are in the whole program. Um, you know, this is, I guess officially we would call this module one just because it's here at the top, but again, the module numbers don't matter because, you know, this is, Kenny and Andres, this is your mod two. Charlie, this is your mod three. You know, my new students coming in, they're mod one. Um, so uh, here's where we're at currently. We are in, we are starting PFT 118, Anatomy and Physiology. So that's why this is a 12 day class. Uh, you know, it's gonna have a midterm on day six, um, which we haven't had a midterm for a while. So Andres, Kenny, you guys will remember we had a midterm your first class. Um, we always start the first, uh, our first class in a module. Uh, as a 12 day course. So it'll be 12 days here. After that, we're gonna go into exercise psychology, which will be really fun. That's where we're gonna talk about like goal setting ha and how to change habits, uh, which is always just a really fun section. Then we will move into uh, OPT for youth specific training. That will be our, our program design youth class. And that'll be our 10 day capper at the end of the module. And then we'll get new people in and we'll, we'll go into the kinesiology mod. Um, and that is pretty much your intro. Uh, do you guys have any questions? Uh, Charlie, Andres, Kenny, you guys feeling good? I'm good, bro. See, the perks of, of being a senior, you're like, I get it. What's that, Kenny? We're good. Spectacular. You're good. All right. Cool, guys. Well, we can dive right in. Uh, which is kind of fun. So uh, in the same way that I got to show a lot of videos in the last class, I get to show a lot of videos in this class, too. Uh, so this is kind of fun. Oh, wait. Oh, what the new versions? Somebody was messing with my PowerPoints <laughs> in the past. They slimmed them down. All right, whatever. Um, God, now I'm all freaked out. I better not have screwed up my PowerPoints. OK. So uh, we are going to be looking at, like I said, chapter, oh wait, I just realized I need to be in this folder anyways. Uh, we're going to be looking at chapter one of uh, your organization of the human body in your Memler's textbook. So if you've got those, you want to follow along, you're more than welcome to. Um, but here are our notes for today. Uh, we'll get these pulled up over here. Apparently this got unformatted. That is perfect. Uh, Um, 
Yeah. Okay. So uh, we got to show a lot of fun videos from Crash Course last time. Uh, this class, uh, it's so funny, guys. Um, so here's here's the thing about like teaching anatomy and physiology. Everyone kind of does it the same. <laughs> like, you know, I mean, do you guys remember like in our last class when I introduced ATP and I talked about mitochondria? I hate saying it, but there's just every anybody who teaches biology or physiology, we all say the same thing. It's like this is the mitochondria, it's the powerhouse of the cell. <laughs> it's super cliche, and everybody hears it. Um, but uh, it's kind of similar in the world of anatomy. It actually goes in a pretty set order that everybody has kind of found is the best way to teach it. Um, so we've got a lot of really fun crash course videos that are gonna directly correspond uh, with this uh, information here. So you're actually gonna notice that uh, we're gonna be showing a lot of those videos and they will uh, directly relate to, to everything we're talking about here and they're gonna go in order. So, um, you know, one of the best ways to review as well, like some students will just watch those videos again. So you guys are always welcome to just kind of <laughs> chill and watch the crash course videos. Uh, you know, only because it's day one and I'm not sure if this is one of our students. Give me one second. I'm just going to answer and make sure this isn't a student here. Hello. Oh, I hate you. Sorry, that was not a student. I do not hate them. Uh, no, I, I <laughs> that was a freaking telemarketer. All right, so annoying. Okay, um, so we are looking at uh, organization of the human body today. So we're looking at chapter one. Um, this is a pretty gentle chapter, actually. This is this is going to be uh, relatively simple, um, relatively quick, uh, and it's just going to be the basics of how we organize the conversation uh, of when it comes to like anatomy and physiology. We all kind of need to have a pretty standard set of terms uh, when we are talking about physiology. Uh, Charlie, this will re seem really familiar to you from your first mod actually today, but uh, Andres, Kenny, you know, we want to have a very set series of like terms and we want to have a language that you and I and everybody else who's a fitness professional can speak um, that takes any of the guesswork out, right? We don't want to say, you know, um, oh, it's above something else, right? Because like, like, let's say like, um, let's say I've got a cut somewhere, right? Uh, internally inside of my body, right? Like I've got, I've got like internal bleeding or something, right? Um, and somebody is trying to figure out where that's at and they have to write it down and describe it to, you know, like another doctor and they say, oh, he's got a cut um, on his esophagus uh, just above, you know, blah, 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 right? Um, so here's the thing, right? Uh, if you give that as an example, it's like above could technically be, you know, that could, that could kind of be left to interpretation, right? Um, above could mean, you know, just straight up, like if you're looking at my body, you could just say like, you know, go up on, on top of it. Right. But also like in the body, like it moves this way too, right. Above could be, you know, maybe a little bit more superficial than something that's like behind something else. Right. Um, so that language is left for interpretation. And then somebody might, you know, go chopping around in my body and screw things up. Right. Same thing is true for muscles. We've got muscles. We don't want to say a muscle is above another muscle. We want to say it's superior to it because superior actually is a little bit different than just above. It means that it is above it, but from a viewpoint of this, what we call the anatomic position. Um, or like, and we know that it doesn't mean above, meaning that it's laying on, you know, one muscle is laying on top of another muscle, because then if it did, we wouldn't say that that muscle is superficial. The muscle laying on top is superficial. The muscle laying below is what we call deep. So we've got some different terms here. We're going to kind of uh, go over some of those terms a little bit today and really get familiar with them. So uh, our overview, we're going to talk about like our body studies today. We'll talk about the differences between like anatomy and physiology. We're not going to talk too much about pathology. Pathology is talking about like diseases, right? Uh, we'll talk a little bit about how we organize the body in terms of when we're studying it and how we classify things. So we'll talk about the differences between chemicals and organs and tissues and or uh, systems and things like that. Uh, and then we'll look at how those things come together to make up our body systems. Then we'll dive a little bit into body direction. So again, that language that's very specific um, to us. Uh, oh, shoot. Awesome. Let's 
Sorry. It's day one. I got a million people reaching out. Uh, Well, that's cool. We got, I forgot we got somebody returning from leave of absence today, too, as well. Oh, and that reminds me. Uh, sorry, guys. Sorry. Okay. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about like uh, body directions and and you know we'll talk we'll discover what the anatomic position is what our terms are our planes of motion we'll talk a little bit about metabolism today uh, although not tons uh, and then we will talk a little bit about body cavities but hardly at all actually um, so um, first thing we're looking at here we got to kind of get our definitions out of the way we got to talk about like what anatomy is right so anatomy is going to be the study of body structure right so we talked a lot. <clears throat> in our last module about physiology and that's the study of like body function right so if anatomy is what the body is physiology is what the body does right and so when you like label a part uh and then you describe like what that part does right so they are definitely a very much linked together which is why this is our anatomy and physiology class uh, but if we look at that it's it's we use anatomy to label body structures and we use physiology to describe how those structures work. We do have pathology as well, which is definitely something we will discuss. Uh, and it definitely does come up here and there. Uh, but for the most part, like, you know, in, in terms of personal trainer pathology, uh, we are really just looking at like certain diseases, which we cover much better next module when we get into our senior class. So we'll talk about heart disease and things like that. Um, then whenever we're studying anatomy, we need to understand our levels of organization. And so this is going to describe the things basically from big to small, right? And so, uh, I'm sorry, from small to big. <laughs> um, so it's going to describe basically how you make up an organism, right? Like you're going to start with chemicals. Like all of us are made of little tiny pieces of chemicals, right? Like living matter, right? Stuff is just made from like all of these elements on the periodic table coming together. Humans, we are mostly made of carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen. Uh, and then we've got some other materials in there as well, right? Um, but we can actually see here, it's kind of a fun uh, picture. Oh, it's tomorrow's lesson, actually. There's kind of a fun picture we'll see tomorrow that kind of shows you, like if you were to fill like a person up, like if there was like a person shaped tube and you were just to fill it up with the various ingredients that, that make us up, most of it is hydrogen because uh, we're mostly made out of water and there's two parts of hydrogen and one part oxygen in a molecule of H2O. And like, you know, we are 60% or higher uh, of water. So we're mostly a lot of like, we're a big, you know, squishy sack of water. <laughs> um, but all of those chemicals come together and they make up our body's cells, right? And so our cells are, you know, these really cool, like little tiny, almost like separate living organisms that all kind of come together to make up us, right? And so you got all kinds of different types of cells and they're going to manifest themselves in all of these unique, different shapes throughout the body. You've got skin cells, which are really cool because, you know, they're able to kind of flatten out. Oh, hey, here's one of our new guys. Awesome. Um, here we go. What's up, Amir? How are you? Welcome, welcome. Oh, can you hear me? I'm here. Yes, how are you doing? I'm good. Good to see you, man. <laughs> Thank you. Um, awesome. So we're we're just in the middle of our first PowerPoint here. Um, I want to give you a tour of the Sochi program at the end of class today. So I'm going to finish up this PowerPoint here, uh, and we're going to finish up today's lesson. We'll let everybody out of class, and then you and I can stick around, and I can kind of walk you through things, okay? Okay. Thank you so much. Cool, cool. Well, enjoy the, enjoy the lesson for now. And if you got questions, don't be afraid to ask. I love questions. They're my, my favorite part of class. Uh, oh, thank you. And I mean that because, guys, I've taught this lesson like 100,000 times. You got to ask me some questions so I get some variety in my life. Uh, <laughs> so um, 
Cells, right, cells are going to make up the different parts of our body's tissue. So you've got skin cells, which are shaped, you know, they can stretch really well. They hold, they hold moisture fairly well, but they're also really good at like, you know, layering themselves up and creating like a protective layer here and, you know, uh, uh, allowing materials to pass through there. You've got muscle cells, which have all these really cool little, you know, proteins in them that allow them to relax and contract. You've got bone cells, which are really like hard and, and able to like shape themselves in this kind of honeycomb shape that makes them really resistant to damage, right? And so, you know, when a bunch of cells all come together, you end up with a body tissue. And a body tissue is, you know, like a grouping of cells that is sort of a larger version of like how the cells are functioning individually, right? Like one muscle cell is attached to another muscle cell, which is attached to another muscle cell. And that's going to make up a whole bunch of like muscle tissue, maybe something like a fascicle, right? Which is a bundle of muscle cells. Now that whole bundle can stretch and relax and contract, right? Uh, and then all of that tissue comes together to make up an organ. And an organ is a little bit, might, might be a little bit of a different definition than you're used to working with. A lot of times we think of our organs, we think of like, you know, your stomach and your intestines and your liver and heart and stuff like that. Um, but really technically, on a level of organization, every single one of your muscles is actually an organ in and of itself each eyeball, uh, even like just you could consider technically, eh, hair's dead tissue, I guess, so not really. Um, but like your skin, that's the largest organ in your entire body, actually. Um, okay, got it. Uh, so, um, so you think about like all of that, all those muscle cells coming together to make up your bicep, right? Well, your bicep is going to be its own, you know, individual little organ that kind of functions its way. Uh, you've got all the cells of your liver that come together and make up your liver organ, right? And they're going to function that way. And then we've got systems, which is things where things really get kind of fun, right? So systems are where multiple organs can work together uh, to provide a function, right? And so, uh, you know, if my liver works together with my gallbladder uh, in order to, you know, liver is going to create bile and it's going to store it in the gallbladder, it's going to drop that off in my small intestine and my small intestine is getting food that came from the stomach. And then all of that material gets churned together and, and sent into my small intestine, which eventually goes through my large intestine, right? And then eventually gets out of my body. That was my digestive system or like, you know, all of the cells of my heart coming together to make up my heart organ, all the cells of my lungs coming together to make up my lung organs, and then my heart and my lungs working together to create my cardiorespiratory system, right? So sometimes you'll have interdependent systems. The system that we are going to spend most of our time talking about is the human movement system. We call that the kinetic chain. Most of our conversations are going to be centered around the muscular system, the skeletal system, and the nervous system. And that's how our body moves around. But obviously, we got to have a lot of conversations about digestion as well, because nutrition is very relevant to us as personal trainers. We've got to talk about the, the cardiovascular system and the respiratory system, because that's going to allow allow us to produce energy and transport materials throughout the body. So all of that comes together. And then when you have a whole bunch of systems that all come together to do, you know, uh, uh, the big job of, you know, creating and maintaining life, that's where you have a friggin' organism, right? And that, that's us, <laughs> right? So uh, living matter is going to make up chemicals. Chemicals are going to make up cells. Cells are going to make up tissues. Tissues are going to make up organs. Organs are going to make up systems. And we are nothing more than a series of systems, uh, you know, maintaining life and, and functioning. Um, so that is sort of the organization here. And then just to give you a really brief overview of, you know, some of the fun systems that are in the body, we've got your integumentary system, uh, which is basically just your skin, but also all the cool stuff that your skin has within it, you know, like you know, you've got arm hair and things like that, uh, that allow like your body to, to work independently with like, um, your, uh, 
uh, uh, cardiovascular system. And so like blood can get up to the surface of your skin, but then your skin can contract and that can cause blood to, to flow down below. And that's how your body can like regulate temperature pretty well. That's why you get goosebumps basically. Um, you get your skeletal system, which is really cool because that gives us like this framework. It protects all the delicate structures inside of our body uh, and, you know, comes together to form all these joints, which can be manipulated into human movement. You've got the muscular system, which is going to control that skeletal system. It's going to move it around, right? Um, you know, I've got a muscle that'll contract and it'll move the two pieces of my skeletal system in different directions. Uh, we've got the nervous system, which controls the muscular system, right? And so like, that's all making like one big movement, right? You get your nervous system controlling your muscular system, which moves your skeletal system, right? It's all interconnected. Um, so the nervous system kind of uh, senses information and controls that information through all these really cool impulses throughout the body. Your endocrine system is creating hormones, um, which are also part of controlling your body. So your nervous system actually, and your endocrine system are very similar in terms of their jobs, but they're very dissimilar in terms of how they do it. You know, uh, like your nervous system, it's pretty much just like a, it's like an on off switch, right? It's like, boop, boop right? Like, it's like, I want to move my arm and I just do it thanks to my nervous system. Uh, but let's say I want to get like amped up, right? <laughs> I want to get like, you know, excited or nervous or scared, right? Well, then you can start creating different like hormones that are running through my body. And that might get me, you know, either really, really amped up or it might make me sleepy, right? And that's why those things are sometimes a little bit hard to control. Like, you know, I'm sure everybody in here has been driving before, and like all of a sudden somebody swerves out of their lane and you're like, ah, you know, and then you get all kind of amped up and then you're on, you're tense and you're, you're on edge until the rest of your drive is over. Right. Um, or if somebody cuts you off, you're angry for the rest of your drive. If you're like me, uh, <laughs> that's your endocrine system, right? Those are hormones, which are designed to kind of get you amped up metabolically. Uh, but it's a very strong, but slow process. So once it happens, it really is a hard time. Uh, kind of slowing that process down. And so it ends up just running through your body and you're like, ah, 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 and you're like, oh, it's okay. I'm calm. I'm calm. No, I'm not. Right. <laughs> like uh, that's your endocrine system. The cardiovascular system. Um, oh, did I hear somebody had a question? No, am I just hearing things? Uh, <laughs> Your cardiovascular system, uh, that's going to be your heart, your blood, and your blood vessels. That's in charge of like providing a pump to move materials throughout your body. Your lymphatic system, kind of similar. That's actually moving water and other materials, fluids throughout the body. Uh, respiratory system, which is allowing you to breathe uh, and extract oxygen from the outside environment. Your digestive system, which is extracting nutrients from very much an inside environment, but that's, you know, getting energy out of food uh, and respiratory system, getting energy out of oxygen, getting all that into your bloodstream. That's your respiratory and digestive system. So it's funny there, you know, I love this, right? We always think of the cardiovascular system. We think of our heart and our lungs working together, but honestly, your respiratory system and your digestive system, they're more similar uh, than any other systems in your body. They're actually, their jobs are, are very similar to each other. They're all about like, you know, getting energy inside, inside of your body. You get your urinary system, which is going to eliminate waste products. And then you get everybody's fa uh, most favorite system, which is the most fun. And that's your reproductive system. Uh, and unfortunately, we're not going to spend a lot of time talking about that one because <laughs> you shouldn't be doing any of that stuff in the gym. <laughs> so uh, let's go ahead and talk a little bit about metabolism here. Right. So those are the different systems throughout the body. Um, now, one of the most important things that your body does is that it has a metabolism, right? And we spent a lot of our time last module talking about metabolism and breaking it down. But you, some of you guys might remember, uh, by definition, metabolism is all life sustaining reactions that occur within the body right? So your body is this series of, you know, cells that need to like stay alive, right? Um, and I love this. I think this is what one of my favorite things about like studying biology. When you think about like, you know, what a, a, what a cell is, right? Uh, and then what a body is, and even what like, just like a chemical is, right? Like chemicals are basically like these little atoms running throughout the universe, right? Uh, and they've got like little protons in the center and they got electrons on the outside, right? And so like there's this, you know, what we call the nucleus in the center there. It's made up of protons and neutrons. And then this 
outside shell of like electrons and that the, the electrons are what do all the really cool stuff that's how they bind to other molecules and then suddenly you've got you know two molecules linked together thanks to the electrons maybe you got three molecules linked together now you got two h you know two molecules of hydrogen and one of oxygen bam you got a molecule of h2o right um so that's really really kind of cool there right and so like you know, in the same way that like a bunch of atoms come together to make up a chemical, a bunch of cells come together to make up us, right? Um, and then I, you know, then we can get really crazy about it. And this, you know, this becomes like a totally different type of conversation because it's like, then you have like people that come together to form up like a freaking city. And you got cities that come together to make up states and states to make up nations. Uh, and then the whole thing looks like the same. We're all on a planet revolving around the sun. It's amazing. I love studying biology. It's my favorite thing. It's super cool. Uh, but the really cool thing about like living creatures, right? Uh, every animal on the planet, you, me um, included, you know, is that we have a metabolism. We have the ability to kind of sustain uh, our own lives, right? Through a series of chemical reactions. And so that's what metabolism is. It's all life sustaining chemical reaction. So um, we are constantly taking materials from the environment <clears throat> and we're breaking them down. And then we are reassembling them in a shape that is useful for us, right? That's really what metabolism is. And so there's two parts to metabolism. There's catabolism and anabolism, right? Uh, we can call these catabolic reactions and anabolic reactions. So catabolic reactions are reactions that break complex substances down into simpler compounds, right? So if I were to take like a burrito, right, which is, you know, made up of like a tortilla on the outside, it's got some beans, some rice, uh, for me, it's going to have some sour cream and salsa, <laughs> uh, and then probably, you know, I'm going to do like, I don't know, let's say carnitas in there, right? So uh, that carnitas is made of like a lot of protein and fat. So now I've got lots of protein, I've got lots of fats, I've got lots of carbohydrates. There are some vitamins that are gonna be in there, particularly very high in B vitamins. Uh, and there's gonna be some minerals as well. You know, there might be a little bit of calcium, some phosphorus, right? Um, it's definitely gonna be some sodium in there, uh, especially if I have anything to say about it because I'm a saltophile. Uh, <laughs> and so, you know, we're gonna have like uh, a lot of different materials uh, inside that burrito. Hey, hold on just a second, we got another. We got another one joining us. Wait for it. Where is she? There we go. Erica, what's up? Hi, hi. Welcome back. Thank you, thank you. Awesome. <laughs> um, all right. So, uh, <clears throat> you know, catabolically, I'm going to take that burrito. And the first part of catabolic <laughs> reactions, the second that it hits my mouth, right? The second it gets onto my tongue and I start like chewing it up a little bit, I'm gonna start breaking that burrito down into tinier and tinier and tinier and tinier pieces, right? And then it's gonna drop into like my stomach acid where it's gonna sit in this little acid bath uh, for a couple hours, okay? And so now the chemicals that are in my stomach, which are made of uh, primarily like things like pepsin and, and gastrin and things like that, but it's also gonna have a ton of hydrochloric acid which is made of hydrogen and chlorine, right? And so chlorine, yeah, that's stuff that's found in bleach. Well, you get a lot of it in your food as well, and you need it in order to, uh, you know, break down your, your foods. And so and that is going to catabolically even further break that down. And now this, this big complex burrito has been broken down into nothing but chemicals, right? It's just a whole bunch of like individual little amino acids because it's not you know it's less complex than a protein it's going to be individual molecules of glucose that that's less complex than a carbohydrate and it's going to be individual fatty acids uh which is less complex than like an overall like big lipid right and so now catabolically my body has taken this really big complicated thing and it broke it down into all of its individual pieces um, you know, it would, I always like to think of it as like, a, I always like to use like a Lego analogy, right? Imagine like you had this big complicated Lego, uh, white house, right? And like, you decided to like take all the individual pieces and just break them down. You're like, all right, I'm gonna throw the gray cubes over there. And we got the American flag cubes over there. And I'm gonna take all these pieces and put them over there, right? There's the steps over there. And there's the, 
I don't know what the White House looks like, pillars and windows over there. <laughs> like, uh, all the different pieces that make up this like Lego thing that you've got. You should have picked something I'm more familiar with. Should have said like the Death Star or something. <laughs> uh, but you break all those individual like Lego pieces down and separate them into sections, right? Now, if you wanted to reassemble those into something else, you want to be like, all right, I want to make a White House. I'm going to take all those Lego pieces and I'm going to turn them into a something I'm more familiar with, Disneyland, <laughs> right? And so you assemble them all into like a new shape, right? That is where we have anabolic reactions, right? So anabolic reactions are where your body is going to reassemble materials to make something that was very, from something very simple into something that is much more complex, right? So catabolic reactions break stuff down. A really good example of that is taking a chicken breast and breaking it down into amino acids and if it happens to be a fatty piece of chicken breast, uh, fatty acids, right? Um, so now you've got individual things to work with. Then anabolically, your body can build those very simple compounds up into something that is U-shaped, right? Um, so a good example of anabolic reactions, building stuff up, right? Taking those amino acids and assembling to get them together to make up new muscle tissue. Because a lot of times people think that like protein is a pretty, you know, direct one-to-one -one conversion, you know, like it, it's as if like somebody, you know, the way people imagine it sometimes, you know, it's like, uh, you know, I worked out and I did some push-ups, and then all of a sudden I went and ate a chicken breast and now I've got bigger pec muscles. Like as if your body was like, is that a chicken breast? That's perfect. We broke our human breast today. Put that right here. You know, like that's not how that works. <laughs> your body breaks it down into individual amino acids and then it reassembles those amino acids, not in a chicken shape, <laughs> in a U shape, right? Or a me shape. Um, and that's how we've got new tissue. And metabolism is constantly doing this. It's constantly breaking stuff down and building stuff up, you know? Uh, and, you know, that constant process uh, is what's keeping your body alive. So our body has like a lot of different ways that it is going to, to keep us alive, right? Um, and that process that process of maintaining life and maintaining this balance of like energy going out versus energy coming in we have a term for that that we call homeostasis this is your body's main job <laughs> like the only thing your body cares about is maintaining homeostasis so homeostasis is your body's internal balance of maintaining life right um so for instance, like if I, you know, it's in the news like crazy right now, the poor people of Texas are so cold. <laughs> um, and, you know, if I were to walk out into like a blizzard um, with no coat or jacket or anything like that, I just walked out into this freezing, freezing, freezing cold temperature, you know, what's the big deal? Like, why would that be so bad for me? Well, what starts to happen is as my body starts to like lose temperature, right? Certain cells within my body cannot function very well. My body has a really hard time delivering certain materials, uh, mainly oxygen, to the different parts of my body, right? This is part of the reason why, if you've ever noticed when you get cold, the first thing that really tends to struggle is like your fingers and toes, right? Uh, like whenever I'm playing ultimate and it's like really cold outside, I always keep my hands in my, you know, under my arms as much as I can. Um, so that I can like keep them nice and warm, you know, uh, because it's going to be really hard for me to catch a Frisbee, uh, or throw one for that matter. Um, if my fingers are really cold. Um, so, uh, and the reason why like that's so difficult is because like, what's going to happen is like my body's going to have this reaction when it notices that it's very, 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 very cold outside. My body will instinctively constrict the blood vessels that are closest to the surface of my skin. My body will go, wow, it is cold out here. And it has to maintain itself. It has to maintain homeostasis. So in order to protect itself, what it will do is it will actually constrict all the blood flow and it will try to keep blood as far away from my skin as possible. What that does is that means that like as cold temperature rushes across my skin, it's not going to carry that cold temperature into my blood, which will then, you know, circulate throughout my entire body. And so the area was with the smallest blood vessels, my fingers and my toes, because these are like very, very small blood vessels in here. Those are the ones that feel the coldest 
first. That's why they're so sensitive. And that's why sometimes it's so hard to heat your hands up uh, is because like, you know, these little tiny blood vessels are going, uh, uh, we don't want to get any colder. So they constrict, which in the end kind of makes the problem almost a little, feels a little worse, <laughs> but it's trying to protect, it's a protective mechanism because your body is trying to maintain homeostasis. It does this with fluid balances as well. If you get too much fluid, your body will go, wow, we got too much fluid. And what it'll do is it'll filter out that fluid through your kidneys and into your bladder. And then your body is going to try and get that fluid out of your body. If you are dehydrated, let's say you don't have enough fluid, your body will pull fluids out of certain tissues in order to maintain uh, other tissues. And that's where, you know, you start to feel a little dehydrated. You start to lose fluid in things like your skin because it's more important to protect your organs that are like keeping your body alive. So that's what homeostasis is. And this is why sometimes it's difficult to lose weight or, or gain weight for that matter. Um, but changing your body composition, losing body fat is difficult because your body really does not want to lose any of that body fat. You know, that body fat could be causing a lot of problems inside of your body, but your body is hardwired to maintain homeostasis. So anytime you got extra calories, your body kept those extra calories to be used later. So now you're tapping into your savings account, right? Anytime you try to like lose a little bit of weight, your body doesn't like that because it goes sort of against this idea of homeostasis. Um, so homeostasis is your body's internal balance. It's how your body maintains its life. Um, and its main job is to maintain homeostasis by any means necessary, right? It can do this by, you know, moving body fluids around, right? In like the extracellular fluid that's maybe outside of your cells or the intracellular fluid, which is inside of your cells. You know, if a cell's having problem fu functioning, it will drive water into the cells, which could pull it from some of your other tissues. And that's going to leave you feeling a little dehydrated, but at least your cells are alive, right? Um, so how does your body maintain this homeostasis? How does your body get back? You know, if it wants to, if there's always like a general source, like there's a, there's your body feeling its best, right? Um, how does your body get back to that? Well, that's where we have this term called negative feedback. Okay. So negative feedback describes how your body returns to its source version. Okay. So I know it's kind of weird because you hear the word like negative feedback. You're like, oh, that's got to be a bad thing, right? Like it's got the word negative in it, right? <laughs> but negative feedback is one of the most important, great things that your body does. Um, and it is how your body returns to its neutral levels. It's, it's a condition uh, getting you back to a norm. Right. So we don't normally have too much cortisol or adrenaline and, you know, stress hormones. We don't have too much of that running through our body at all times, but we use adrenaline and things like that um, to run through our body to amp us up. You know, uh, if I want to get like amped up, you know, to do like an athletic event or something, um, you know, adrenaline's really great at doing that. But I don't want that to run through my body all the time. So what'll happen is if I create a bunch of adrenaline and then I'm done with my athletic event, my body's got to get me back to normal. It has to remove the adrenaline from me. Amir, you got a question? Oh, no, 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 sorry. Oh. No sweat. Um, so my body's got to get me back to neutral, right? So it's going to use negative feedback to get me back to neutral. Or if I've got too much sugar in my blood, right? My body needs to use negative feedback to get my blood sugar levels back to normal. Or if my blood sugar levels are too low, my body has to use negative feedback to get me back to normal. So negative feedback is how we get ourselves back to neutral, okay? Um, so a really good example of this, uh, when we think about it, is think of like a thermostat, right? So let's say you've got a thermostat set to 70 degrees, uh, and then you open up the door, um, and the room ends up cooling down. You can tell this uh, example was not made here in California. <laughs> if you open the door, it'll probably heat the freaking room up. Uh, <laughs> but you've got the thermostat set to 70 degrees. You open up the door, and what ends up happening is, you know, the whole room cools down, right? The room gets really, really cold. Uh, it drops by four degrees. So now the room's only 66 degrees, and the thermostat's measuring that. And the thermostat goes, ah, nope, we are set to 70. So what it'll do, it kicks on your furnace and then some heat starts to come into the house and that raises the room temperature back to 70 degrees. That is an example of negative feedback, okay? 
you had it set to a neutral position, it fell outside of that neutral position. So it took steps in order to get back to that neutral position. So here's a really good example, right? We can see like, you know, if it gets too hot, negative feedback, we'll get it back to the middle line. If it gets too cold, negative feedback, we'll get it back to the middle line. And so it's just going to continually, you know, try to balance in this middle line. Now, I want you guys to imagine uh, the exact same thing happening with glucose levels inside of your body. Think about food, right? We only want to have so much sugar running through our blood. We don't want to have too much sugar. We want to have just the right amount. And so when we eat food, what's going to happen is your body's going to break that food down and release all of the sugar found within that food. So your blood sugar levels are going to elevate. Now, hopefully it doesn't go too far outside of normal ranges, but no matter what it does, your body is going to release this hormone called insulin created by your pancreas, right? Your pancreas will release that insulin into your body. And then insulin is going to act on the cells of your body uh, in order to take up that glucose and lower your blood sugar levels back to neutral. So if it happens inside of like a cell that is like a muscle cell, right? Then that muscle cell might take that sugar out of the blood and store it as glycogen, uh, which can be used for energy production later. Um, or maybe your body goes, well, I don't have any room to put stuff in glycogen. So the insulin then will convert that blood sugar into body fat tissue, into individual fatty acids, and then it will store those fatty acids in the form of body fat, which is sort of the thing we want to avoid, right? Um, but either way, that will get your blood sugar levels back to neutral, right? Um, so now imagine, right, this was our temperature before, right? We fell outside of normal ranges, and so then our body, you know, our thermostat kicked on to try to get it back to normal, right? Now imagine this is blood sugar, right? You're, you eat, eat a big meal, and then your body releases insulin that drives sugar out of your blood. Then as your blood sugar levels start to get really low, your body creates a different hormone, which might make you feel hungry. So then you go get some more food that raises up your blood sugar levels, right? And ideally we wanna have these nice smooth lines, right? But if you're spiking those lines like crazy, like you're raising your blood sugar levels through the roof, so then your body creates a ton of insulin, which drives way too much sugar out of your blood, right? Then all of a sudden you're like, oh my God, I am starving right? Because now you have no sugar in your blood and your body creates massive amounts of hunger hormones. Then because you have so much hunger hormones, you eat a lot of food again. All of a sudden you overeat. Again, you spike really far outside of those normal ranges, right? And now suddenly we're just having a really hard time controlling our blood sugar levels. And that can lead to metabolic disorders like diabetes, right? So that's negative feedback. Negative feedback describes getting us back to a source. Now there is also positive feedback. Positive feedback, you're not gonna hear about this too often, but it does happen every now and then. Positive feedback is uh, basically going to intensify a response. So actually the example I just gave with the blood sugar is kind of a good example of positive feedback. You know, negative feedback is going to get your blood sugar levels back to normal. But let's say uh, your blood sugar levels are so high that your body is like, man, our blood sugar levels are through the roof. Um, we need to get rid of, you know, all this sugar. So it creates a little bit of insulin. And unfortunately, that insulin just doesn't work. It doesn't do as much as it's supposed to. And there's still elevated blood sugar levels. Well, then your body will go, all right, fine. Here's a ton of insulin. So then it makes a whole bunch. And then all of a sudden that drives the sugar out of your blood. That example of like, it didn't work the first time. So your body intensified a response to make it even bigger. That's positive feedback. So positive feedback intensifies a response. If a condition doesn't have a strong enough effect, positive feedback will enhance that effect even bigger, right? That's kind of when you think of when you think like adrenaline, you know, <laughs> like, and you're like, oh, and you get kind of amped up and you're like, I'm calm, I'm calm. No, I'm not calm. And you kind of like have a hard time turning it off, right? It's really because like, chances are you didn't get as big enough of a kick the first time. So then your body did positive feedback and then it kind of overdid it. <laughs> Um, any questions so far? How are you guys feeling about metabolism? We're going to make a sort of a, we're going to pivot co the conversation here into a different area. Any questions, guys? I'm, I'm good, bro. Awesome. Erica, Amir, you guys feeling good? Yes. I'm good. Yes. All righty. Awesome. Awesome. Let's go ahead and take a look. We're going to go ahead, uh, 
we're going to change directions here. No, no pun intended. Um, for those of you who are reading the slides. Uh, <laughs> we're going to kind of pivot in our conversation here. We're going to talk about something that's really, really, really relevant to us as personal trainers. Now, um, Amir, this is your very first day here. Uh, so I want to say, just uh, say this up top. You're going to see a lot of terms right now. Uh, we're going to move through them relatively quickly. Um, don't feel like you have to have these memorized by tomorrow or anything like that. That would be totally crazy. Um, but these are some directional terms. I want to kind of introduce a little bit of language to you guys, get you familiar with talking the talk a little bit, right? So we want to talk a little bit about like these standardized terms that we can use in order to describe the different locations here throughout the human body, right? So our directional terms, they are a standardized set of terms used by health, you know, like doctors and fitness professionals like us in order to describe different locations and different movements inside of the body. So the first two we're going to look at, <clears throat> oh, and actually before I even in go into this, I also want you guys to remember all of these terms are from a perspective of what we call the anatomic position, okay? So the anatomic position, I want you to imagine a person standing with feet hip width apart, toes pointing straight forward, arms at their sides with their palms facing forward like this. So I'm standing in the anatomic position. So whenever I describe something and I say that it's superior, right? What I mean is it is above in a vertical direction. It's above a point of reference if I were standing in the anatomic, anatomic position. Now, if I were standing on my hands, right? If I were sta or standing on my head or whatever, uh, if I were completely upside down, um, and now my head is at the lowest point on my body and my feet are at the highest point on my body, it doesn't matter. From the anatomic position, my head is the most superior thing on my body and my feet are the most inferior thing on my body. It doesn't matter if I'm standing on my hands or not, because whenever we use directional terms, we are talking about it as if it is from the anatomic position and only from the anatomic position. That way, there's never anything left for interpretation, right? You cannot like say, well, what position was their body in? Doesn't matter. It is either superior or inferior if you were to unfold their body and put them in the anatomic position, okay? So superior is a position that is above a point of reference. And if no point of reference is given, then we assume the midline of the body uh, where basically these three points meet. Uh, the body's midline. So that's going to be this midpoint. <laughs> uh, I thought we have the line, there we go. Uh, this midpoint right here where it's met down the middle this way, the middle this way, and the middle in the side there, right? This midpoint right there is what I'm talking about. So anything above that, if I don't give you a point of reference, is considered superior, right? So uh, this only moves vertically. Inferior also only moves vertically. And that's a position below a point of reference. Now, we've also got anterior. <clears throat> anterior is on the front of the body, and posterior is on the back of the body. Right. So like my pectoral muscles, right, my chest muscles are on the anterior part of my body, uh, my scapula, my shoulder blade in the back, that is on the posterior part of the body. My biceps are anterior, my triceps are posterior. Uh, then we've also got medial and lateral. And these only move side to side. So medial is nearer the midline and lateral is farther from the midline. So my nose is very, very medial and uh, my eyeballs are both lateral, but my ears are even more lateral, right? So uh, lateral is farther from the midline and it moves horizontally like this. So superior and inferior move vertically, medial and lateral move laterally or horizontally. Uh, and then there's proximal and distal. Now, these are the ones that sometimes get a little confusing, but proximal is closer to the origin of something, right? Uh, and distal is farther from the origin. So let's say, like, let's take a look at the uh, forearm. Let's take a look at, uh, at the, the, actually, this is perfect here. So you take a look at the arm here, right? So I've got two sides 
to uh, my wrist here, right? Uh, I'm sorry, my forearm here, <laughs> teaching anatomy. Uh, <laughs> I got two sides to it, right? I've got this side up here and I got this side. And they both meet, they've got a joint at the top and they've got a joint at the bottom here. So what I have is like, where does something originate? Well, it's gonna originate closest, again, to that midline. So I want you to almost imagine it's like a like a highway, right? You got to, how many miles do you have to drive from the wrist up and into the midline of the body versus how many miles do you have to drive from the elbow back to the midline of the body, right? So the one that is closer, we call that the origin, right? The one that's farther, we call that the, the, the insertion, right? Uh, the origin is always considered proximal because it's within proximity, it's close to something. And the uh, insertion is always going to consider be considered distal. Uh, that's going to be far away from something, right? Um, so when we use proximal and distal, it's like if we are describing <clears throat> two different points on the body, like if I give three points of reference, right? Uh, proximal and distal could be something like that, right? So for instance, like, let's say it gets a little bit complicated. We'll look at my face, right? Um, you know, I've got like my nose, which is kind of in the center of my face. My mouth is below that. My eyes are on both sides. My ears are, you know, a little bit further from that, right? Um, so if my nose is like the center of my face, what is most proximal to that? Uh, probably my eyeballs, right? Like, this is coming all the way up to about here, right? My eyes are proximal compared to everything else on my face. Whereas like my ears, which are pretty far away, are very con are considered distal. Now at the same time, my eyes are also a little bit more lateral and then my ears are even more lateral than that. But we can use either term here, depending on like what it is, like what perspective it is that we're talking about, right? Um, now let's say I've got a very uneven face. Right. Let's say my left eye sits a little bit over here and my right eye is exactly where it normally normally is. Right. So now I've got an asymmetric, you know, Picasso face. <laughs> right. Uh, let's see here. Picasso face. <laughs> you know, we got a you get something kind of like this. Right. Um, well, now it's like this eyeball is very is clearly a little bit closer than this one. So this eyeball would be considered proximal whereas this eyeball would be considered distal, right? That's cool. <laughs> um, so uh, that's how we use proximal and distal, right? My wrist is considered distal compared to my forearm. My forearm is considered proximal in this case, right? But at the same time, my wrist is considered proximal if you consider my fingertips, like this is still closer than these are. So this is where like the perspective side of it really does come into play. And typically guys, you're really only ever going to use proximal and distal whenever you're talking about the arms and legs. So, you know, <clears throat> the most traveling down my arm, the most proximal part would be my elbow, then my wrist, then my palm, then my fingertips, right? Um, and then, you know, we would be getting more and more and more distal as we go away from the center. Uh, how's everybody doing on that one? That one sometimes gets a little confusing. Feeling good, guys? Yes. All righty. Next one we've got, uh, we've got our directional term. So now we also need to talk about like if we are moving in a different place, right? And so you can see here superior, inferior, anterior, posterior, proximal, they're drawing it close to, distal, they're drawing it farther from. Um, I also really, actually really quickly, I also really like to do this um, and show this using like a circle sometimes. Um, so if I took like a, draw like a big circle here, right? And then I put a big dot in the center of it. Uh, let's go like that. We just put a dot there, right? So uh, if it is close to this side, you know, if it's close to the, to the midline moving horizontally, uh, this would be medial. If it is farther from the midline, uh, this would be considered lateral. If it is above the midline, that is superior. If it is below the midline, ugh, that's getting messy. That would be inferior. <laughs> I need one of those freaking pens. Um, 
if it is uh now here's how i like to do it if it's going in a diagonal close to the midline right? so that would be like if it was you know just getting close to the center that's proximal and then moving on a diagonal you know away from the midline that would be distal right and all that is from the perspective of you know this midline on both sides that got really messy at the end this is i need a whiteboard <laughs> but those are our, our directional terms there now we also in addition to that <clears throat> have some planes of motion that we have to talk about as well right so your planes of motion are where movement in the human body primarily takes place um, so your planes of motion are these three imaginary planes that are going to bisect the body uh, at right angles to each other and they're going to cut the body straight through the middle um, depending on like what perspective we're talking about so our first plane of motion we'll talk about is the frontal plane the frontal plane is going to divide me into an anterior and a posterior half so if we look at like the frontal plane right um that's going to cut me down the midline there we go Ooh, actually, no, I don't. That is low quality. Hold on. <laughs> uh, there we go. This is actually the one in, in your textbook. <laughs> and it's the highest quality image. There we go. So there is the, like, if I got cut into an anterior and a posterior half, you cut me down the middle like this way, right? Divide me down the middle. That is the frontal plane. And I would move along that plane, right? I would do things like this and this, or maybe this and this right that is these are frontal plane movements right side to side movement so i side shuffled if i did a lateral lunge a step up to the side right <clears throat> uh, uh shoulder raises right uh hip abduction like we did yesterday um those are frontal plane movements right i'm moving primarily side to side right um because I'm being divided into a front and back half. So here's some examples here, like a dumbbell lateral raise or like side shuffling, you know, down like a field. Those are both frontal plane movements. Then you've got the sagittal plane. And the sagittal plane is this version here. That's going to cut me down the middle like this. That's going to divide me into a left side and a right side. And so if I were to move front to back like this, like squatting, deadlifting, bicep curls, tricep extensions, right? All of those are very much sagittal plane movements, shoulder flexion, shoulder extension, right? Movements like that, those are sagittal plane movements, right? Then if you were to cut me in half into a superior and inferior part, right? Cut me down the waist or right at the head here, right? Uh, that would be movements that would move along like this, like twisting movements those are transverse plane movements okay so the transverse plane divides me into an upper and lower half so the neck can do all of this the neck is really cool right the neck if you were to cut me into a left and right side or i went like this that's a sagittal plane movement if you were to divide me down to a side to side version that would be a frontal plane movement and if you were to divide it into an upper and lower section that would be a transverse movement Right, so those are our three planes of motion that we describe, right? So frontal plane movements would be like a lateral raise or side shuffling, right? Uh, sagittal movements would be like bicep curls or walking lunges uh, and transverse movements would be things like Russian twists or wood chops, stuff like that, okay? Um, and there's, uh, there's the picture uh, <laughs> it pulled up on Google. Um, so there's the frontal plane. There's the sagittal plane and there's the transverse plane. You guys definitely want to be super, super, super familiar with those three terms. That's going to be a lot of uh, a lot of your test questions and understanding of like movement and things like that. Um, they definitely come up when you're looking at these planes of motion. Um, and then we got a little bit of word anatomy here. Uh, you know, we've got uh, these are just kind of fun at the end of your chapters. You guys can pay attention to these if you do want to know where a lot of these words come from. Uh, this is their origin. This is the etymology of words um but you don't have to <laughs> i don't need you guys to memorize what uh you know patho means or anything like that I, that's actually not um 
super relevant to this class. But if you ever do, you know, want to kind of get into it, it's kind of fun. Um, so they're always going to be at the end of the chapters and at the end of the PowerPoints there. So I want to show you guys a quick little video, kind of summarizing everything that we just talked about today. Um, this is just going to be a brief video describing those directional terms uh, that I just mentioned here. Um, and it'll have an ad, of course, viewing <laughs> <Getting> that. <laughs> so uh, this is a very brief summary of everything I talked about. And this is pretty helpful, guys. Like these videos uh, <clears throat> can really be a great way for you to kind of absorb the info. And, you know, it basically summarizes everything I talked about today in about 10 minutes. So I'd like you to take a second to really look at yourself. I don't mean <clears throat> take stock of your life, which really isn't any of my business. But I mean, just look at your body. Hold up your hand. Wiggle it around, take a sip of water, hold your breath, sniff the air. These things are so simple for most of us that we don't give them a moment's thought. But each one of those things is oh so much more complex than it feels. Every movement you make, every new day that you live to see is the result of a collection of systems working together to function properly. In short, you, my friend, are a magnificent beast. You are more convoluted and prolific and polymorphously awesome than you probably even dare to think. For instance, did you know that if they were all stretched out, your intestines would be about as long as a three-story building is tall? Or that by the time you reach old age, you'll have produced enough saliva to fill more than one swimming pool? Or that you lose about two-thirds of a kilogram every year in dead skin cells, and you will lose more than 50 kilograms of them in your lifetime? Just tiny, dried-up pieces of you drifting around your house and setting it on your bookshelves, feeding entire colonies of dust mites. You're your own little world, and I'm here to help you get to know that world, the body that you call a home, through the twin disciplines of anatomy, the study of the structure and relationships between body parts, and physiology, the science of how those parts come together to function and keep that body alive. Anatomy is all about what your body is, physiology is about what it does, and together, they comprise the science of us. Complicated science, I'm not going to lie to you, and it draws on a lot of other disciplines like chemistry and even physics. And you'll have to absorb a lot of new terms, lots of Latin, gobs of Greek. But this course isn't just going to be an inventory of your individual parts or a diagram of how a slice of pizza gives you energy, because these disciplines are really about why you're alive right now and how you came to be alive how disease harms you, and how your body recovers from illness and injury. It's about some big picture stuff that we either spend most of our time thinking about or trying not to think about. Death and sex and eating and sleeping, and even the act of thinking itself. All processes that we can understand through anatomy and physiology. If you pay attention, and if I do my job well enough, you'll come out of this course with a richer, more complete understanding, not only of how your body works, everything from handshakes to heart attacks, but I think you'll also start to see that you really are more than just the sum of your parts. <laughs> understand the living body.